powerful or any missionary experiences that they can share with us that tie back to what we've been studying in the in the sessions bridging and viewing others as the lord sees them meaning having a single eye glory to the or having an eye single to the glory of god or who's had experiences that that can tie back to build testimony on the fact that missionary work does work and it's easier than we make it out to be And whoever wants to share, just make sure you, you unmute so we can hear you. Uh, I guess I can share. Um, we have a, a piano teacher um, that teaches my younger siblings. She's not a member. And so me and my companion were doing some personal study at my house. And then I realized that I received this prompting to give her a Book of Mormon. So it was, it was a little nerve wracking, obviously, but, but it was just so overpowering, the, the feeling that I felt and, and the, the prompting that I was given to go uh, ask her if she liked to read. So I went and asked her if she liked to read and, and was able to give her a book. Haven't followed up yet, which is bad on my part, but I will today. Um, yeah, so she really likes to read. She reads a lot, so I hope she will be able to read it. Did you ask her if she likes to read? Yeah. He said um, he did ask. Sorry. <laughs> so, Elder Erickson, I have a question for you. So when you gave, you asked her if she liked to read, and she said yes, and then you gave her a Book of Mormon, right? How did you actually go about giving her the Book of Mormon? Like, walk us through your process. Well, it was it was anything but perfect, but I I remember um, we us talking about writing a little testimony and then marking in third Nephi eleven, and so I just told her about a little bit of third Nephi eleven and and it's about Jesus Christ coming and ministering to the Americas, um, and that's that's about the extent I went into. But yeah, I just marked that page, I guess, and. I don't know. It wasn't it wasn't as good as I want it to be or like it could be better. But it, you know what? Good. I love. No, I love. I love how you did that because, <clears throat> you know, you keep saying it could be better. But you want to know what most people do? They do nothing. Right. So you got to remember that action leads to, you know, positive outcomes. Right. So never, ever look at yourself if you don't feel that you executed well, but you at least executed, you know, you gotta, you gotta kind of look at how the Lord looks at that. And you never know, remember we talked about ripple effects. You never know how that book travels. You never know what ends up happening. So don't look at how you, you know, kind of your end of how did I execute, right? I mean, we can always work on it. We can always become better. But what we don't want to be guilty of, and I think, uh, uh, I'll call you Elder Campbell Gage, right? Um, from your days, as a, he had to come back under the COVID time, but he's looking to go back out into the field, right? So he's one that went out, came back and went out. So let me ask your experience, uh, Elder Campbell. Uh -huh. uh, what do you think about, how, how did you learn was the best way to, to hand out a Book of Mormon? Um, something that I... I always used was to make it personal to them um, because then it is not relying off you or your companion. It, it, it's specific to them. So you would, I don't know, there's, there's a billion different ways you can connect it to them. But the second you do connect it, they're like, okay, this, this is for me, you know, and that really helps you get going. Um, but something I would do when I was walk, walking anywhere, um, whether it was a, to an appointment or, or just to the church building or something is I would always carry one in my hand. And uh, not only would it kind of remind me uh, what I'm trying to, not necessarily trying to get rid of it, it, it would remind me that I'm trying to, like, that's why I'm on my mission to preach that book and to, and to, to share the doctrine of Christ. Awesome. So, Elder Erickson, what did you learn from that? 
Um, I should have related it a little better to her, to what I guess I don't really know her needs, but maybe testify of something that I've learned from it that could apply to her. Yeah, so it's the idea of making it personal, right? So you make it connect. <clears throat> and we'll talk about this a little bit more today, but you want to have that, that Book of Mormon not just be a book, but you want to actually, in a sense, make it sticky in their head. And the way you do that is by somehow connecting that in a personal way. So Elder Campbell, right on. And we'll talk about that more today, but perfect. Uh, Elder Olson, I'll let you kind of continue if there's any. Is there anyone else who wants to share? So we've had a lot can, of. Can I butt in real quick? Yeah, please. Yeah. So uh, right at the beginning, we talked about inviting people, and Ryan told me to invite Elder Haymeyer. Elder Haymeyer was my last companion on my mission. And so I went ahead and just sent him a quick message. And so Elder Haymeyer and his companion are actually on here, and they're currently serving in the, the Boise, Idaho mission. Beautiful. So yeah. hold, on. We, hold on, we got to stop here. You can continue. But Elder Haymeyer. Yeah. 20 some odd years ago. I was in a place called Guayaquil, Ecuador. Yeah. <laughs> city in an area called Alborada. Okay. And I served with a missionary by the name of Elder Haymeyer. Yeah. Elder Lex yeah. Haymeyer. Now, do would you happen to know Elder Lex Haymeyer? <laughs> I think so. I don't know. <laughs> That's Who, so who's great. That? Huh? That's my Who dad. Is that? That's He's my dad. dad. <laughs> so it just goes to show it is a sport. <laughs> your dad is awesome, by the way. Thank you. You're awesome. I don't really yeah, know you, but you're yeah. you. So I, I just had to kind of bring that around because that's kind of a fun story. No, you're good. That's so crazy. And where are you serving? So, yeah, we're in uh, Caldwell, Idaho right now. We're in the Idaho Boise Mission. Yep. Excellent. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So, Elder Olson, back to you. Hey, awesome. It's good to have new folks join us all the time. This is something... Uh, that and and when Gage or Elder Campbell invited you, Elder Haymeyer, um, and, and your companion, I hope he let you know that this is something that will help you as missionaries be more effective. So we're going to talk about that again tonight. We've talked about a lot of things. All our previous sessions have led up to this point, and here's where I want to start tonight. So this week, I got a text message from one of the members of, our, of Harvesting the Lord's Way. Here's what his text message said. He said, read Helaman 15, 6 through 7. So I grabbed my scriptures. I sat up on my bed. I, I grabbed them, and I, I started looking. And he says, whoa, verse 7 teaches how we should teach. I want your guys' insight on it. So he copied Brother Lundgren as well. And then he says, um, uh, Brother Lundgren asked him, what is it about these verses that you found interesting? He said, insight on the missionaries of old. He said, verse 6 shows us the success about growing their numbers daily. And 7 talks about how to teach an investigator. Or should I say, 7 is the guiding steps of a missionary to an investigator who we now call friends, right? So if everyone can take real quick and go in their gospel library to Helaman 15, 6 through 7, and then I will share my response to this young man. So we're Helaman chapter 15, verses 6 through 7. I'll give everyone just a second to get there. All right, so I'm going to start reading. Just follow along, and I want you to pay close attention and relate these scriptures to yourself personally. Yea, I say unto you that the more part of them are doing this, and they are striving with unwearied diligence, that they may bring the remainder of their brethren to the knowledge of the truth. Therefore, there are many who do add to their numbers daily. So this is the first thing this young man who texted me was thinking about, right? How are they adding to their numbers daily? Well, number one is unwary diligence. If you actually, and what I did was scanned up to the verse above, starting in verse five, where it is said, and I would that ye should behold that the more part of them 
are in the path of their duty. So that's number one. They're in the path of their duty and they do walk circumspectly before God and they do observe to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments according to the law of Moses. Yea, I say unto you that the more part of them are doing this and they are striving with unwearied diligence that they may bring the remainder of their brethren to the knowledge of the truth. Therefore, there are many who do add to their numbers daily. Now we skip to verse seven. And behold, ye do know of yourselves for ye have witnessed it, right? You're all on missions or you're members of the church or you're currently preparing to go on a mission. Ye do know of yourselves, for ye have witnessed it. That is your testimony. That as many of them as are brought to the knowledge of the truth and to know of the wicked and abominable traditions of their fathers and are led to believe the holy scriptures, yea, the prophecies of the holy prophets, which are written, which leadeth them to faith on the Lord and unto repentance, which faith and repentance bringeth a change of heart unto them. You know it, and you're a witness. You wouldn't be here without that witness. That's so important. Now let's go back to my response to him in, in text form. So um, he said, he finished his little, his, his little blurb here in, in the text by saying, the rest of the chapter is good too. The rest of the chapter is great. Go read it. Study it. Here's my response to him. And I hope you have your notepads and pens. This is good stuff. This is not stuff that you're going to find unless you're scuba diving in the scriptures. You get down beneath the words. So I say, these are some of my favorite verses in scripture. This is about missionary work. However, it details how all the church or the more part of them walked circumspectly which means careful, prudent, and watchful in the ways of God. So all of the church, or the more part of them, is walking in the ways of God. And they're doing it in a way which is careful, prudent, and watchful. So I want you to take note for yourselves, right? Remember the prophet asks us to be repentant daily. Daily. Repent daily. Are you walking circumspectly in the ways of God? And you don't have to answer right now. I want you to write this down. This is a good question to ask when you kneel down by your bed at night to say your prayer to close out your day. Am I walking circumspectly before God? What does that mean? Careful, prudent, and watchful. They are all, or the more part of them at least, united in doing missionary work. So these verses aren't just talking about full-time missionaries. I, I think it's great that this young man related it to himself as a full as a soon-to-be full-time missionary. But here's my real thought: how many of us in the church relate this to ourselves? as missionaries they are all or the more part of them at least united in doing missionary work missionaries and members alike should be striving with unweary diligence to save themselves and their brethren but most today can't even get out of bed without driving the diligence without driving with diligence to kick the blankets off themselves in the morning Right. A lot of us in the church have a hard time even getting out of bed in the day. It's a hard life. We're facing a lot of trials and a lot of challenges. So here's how I finished my text to him. These verses detail what I refer to as the exponential duplication theory of missionary work. If missionaries want to duplicate their efforts and baptize thousands versus one or two or maybe three, right, throughout the entirety of their mission. They need to involve members. Bring yourself, right? Here's the theory. Bring yourself, but next time bring one more and invite them to bring more and so on and so forth. 
there's, there's a great example of this. When we as missionaries get so good at committing people to bring one, right? So just as an example, we're a little bit limited on, on our attendance tonight, right? We've got one, two, three, four, five. Uh, we've got 11 participants. And I'm, I'm not counting where you've got two or three people on one camera. I'm count, counting 11 meeting participants. If each of us brought one next week, we would have how many? 22, right? If there's just 11 of us and we each bring one, well, what happens the week after when we each bring one? Well, all of a sudden we have 44. And what happens the next week when all 44 decide to live up to a commitment to bring one? So, right, if we go back to Helaman in, in chapter 15 and we look at what was said about these missionaries in this time and the members. Therefore, there are many who do add to their numbers daily. As a missionary, you cannot do it on your own. You need the members and members are missionaries too. But sometimes we forget as members how to do the work. So here's, here's my response to him. I said, bring yourself, but next time bring one more and invite them to bring more and so on and so forth. For many years, the church has asked missionaries to get members to provide referrals. While serving as ward mission leader, I took a notepad and walked into Relief Society. Elders quorum, young men and young women's and primary with the missionaries. And I made it awkward. I invited everyone to write down two names of people that they knew with their phone numbers and addresses who could benefit from an appointment with the missionaries. We received about 350 referrals that day. Now, here's where I would caution the missionaries. Take care of the referrals you receive from the members. Two days later, the missionaries were whitewashed out of that area and replaced with sisters. The sisters called me and said, we understand you're our word mission leader. Are members ready to help us? I responded and said, on the desk in your living room is a list of over 350 referrals that you need to start setting appointments with immediately. Four days later, they called and said they'd spilled water on the list and couldn't read it. So we'll just go knock on some doors instead. Think about, think about the, the, the relationship between the members and the missionaries at that point, right? I had gone as a ward mission leader and made everyone uncomfortable standing in Elders Quorum Relief Society, young men, young women's primary, and, and demanding in a forceful commitment that they give us referrals. Many in the church would say, Brother Olson is crazy. But sometimes craziness yields results. I made everyone uncomfortable. Everyone wrote down names, even the primary children. And what happened to those referrals? They were lost. They were not cared for. So as missionaries, we need to always check on our referrals. Always. I have a great story about that. We baptized a gentleman here um, about a year ago. I think they're coming up on the time now when, when they can go to the temple and the temple is up and running. Uh, but he, using the LDS Tools app, has given so many referrals in, in Haiti that the missionaries are running crazy just trying to keep up with his referrals. That leads back to what was happening in Helam in chapter 15, right? They were adding to their numbers daily. Daily. We need to enable this duplication and this, this method of being willing and able to commit people. I, I think it's great that we can look at that and go, yeah, they, they baptized hundreds of people. Right. There was um, a, an interview that we recently did for a podcast where the respondent to one of our questions said, where, where 
since the church was formed or even 1930, has the prophet ever come out or the church or the Lord and said, missionaries, we only want you to baptize one, maybe two on your mission instead of thousands. It has never been said, ever. And I challenge any one of you to go through church history and prove me wrong. In fact, it has been stated otherwise that the Lord will bless you with sheaves upon your backs. That's pretty powerful. We just need to open our minds to the understanding that when we work with members effectively and we utilize the tools of bridging that Brother Lungring was so great to teach us and we utilize the the Lord's way of looking at people with an eye single to his glory. So real quick, I want to ask a question before I turn it over to Brother Lungry. Um, how many of you who are currently serving a mission full-time have benefited from using the members in your area to do missionary work more effectively? And if so, I want to know how. Or if you've served a mission. I mean, so, so here, over here, like, I've had a few members who, who like, are super nice, you know, and they're, like, they're always trying to help. But you can tell that they're not willing to, like, they won't, they won't give referrals to people who are not ready, you know, like to missionaries who are like messing around and stuff. And so we can see when, like, we have to build that trust. Like, it's not just something that, like, I think it was in a talk that Elder Bednar gave, like, when he was, like, talking about how there was missionaries coming to his home and stuff. And they're just, like, not really, like, being polite, not really, like talking to him that much and then just being like, all right, well, do you have any referrals? It's like, that's not how it works, you know? It's something that you have to build with, you have to build trust with them. And then once you build that trust, like, you get those, like, they, they want to give you referrals, you know? They want to help you. And so I've had people give us referrals because they trust us. And it, obviously, it doesn't always work out, you know? But it's so helpful when you develop that relationship first with the members. Elder Haymeyer, I appreciate you sharing that. How do you build trust so that members will give you referrals? Give me an example. Um, so, I mean, like, so one thing, obviously, like, their service and, like, um, asking, just, like, ask them questions. Like, like, get to know them, you know, get to know them personally and take time out of your day to, to be supportive in any way you can, you know. And it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you have to be, like, do good stuff just towards them but like doing good stuff towards everyone in the ward and like they see your effort. And so once you, once they see your effort and they see that like you're ready, you know, they see that you're, you're ready to start working. So it's a, it's a big difference when like when that happens, you know, when you, when you actually try to build the trust or when you're just kind of like, like just like chilling, you know. Elder Haymeyer, I appreciate you sharing that. Tell me one more thing here, if you don't mind. Um, how long have you been out on your mission? I've been out for a little over eight months. Okay, great. So you're a, you're a veteran. So let I, don't me know about, I don't know about that, but uh, it's, been, um, it's been weird because of the, because of COVID, but, um, and work's slowed down in some areas, but I mean, trying to use Facebook when Facebook is designed to like distract you and stuff is, that's been hard, you know? That's oh, I bet. Really now, um, let, let me ask you this. Do you have an example from the last eight months that you could share with us about mm -hmm. how you built trust with a member and how that impacted positively the missionary work you're doing? Um, there, yeah, I mean, like, I had one time where, I mean, like, I don't know, like, exactly, like, I mean, what I did to, to get their trust, but, like, I just know that, um, we went we went over for dinner to this one family's family's um, family's house today, and or I mean sorry not today in Caldwell. And then they he just told me he's like he's like 
I can tell that you guys are you guys are hardworking. I can tell, like he's like, I can feel your spirit, you know. I can feel that you aren't you aren't messing around, you know. You guys are here to, to work. And it was really cool because it's like you don't always hear that, you know. There's often times when like I should know that, you know, I should I should know that that we have we have a lot of power, you know, we have a lot of we have that spirit with us. But he for him to tell me that and then give me a referral was like that's awesome, you know, because he he saw that I was doing a lot of service for for people and asking in the, around the ward like, can we how can we do a service for how can we help like how can we help you guys, you know? And so it was cool to to have him say that he's like yeah, so there's these people like like my neighbors and like there's people right here and like in front, so it's really cool to to be able to realize that you've gained that trust that you have that um, to to help you, you know. Yeah, I totally believe that, Elder Haymeyer. What do you think is the best way to show this member your gratitude for those referrals? I mean, I think just being like straight up with them, just being like, like thanking them. Like you can't really thank them enough, you know, because like that's such a nice thing for them to do. Um, I think trying to repay them back with service, like like service is like that's the thing. Service in this mission is like the main thing that we that we do, especially because of the virus. Like that's like. That takes a lot of time. Like we're supposed to do like ten hours max, but sometimes we end up going over that. And with Elder Campbell, we did so much. We helped this guy build a theater, like like an indoor or like a, a little movie theater, and it's it was awesome. And so let me uh, let me give you let me give you a hint on what the member might want to see as a form of gratitude. All right, and this is just this is the gospel according to Brother Olson, no one else go and teach those referrals, right? One of the best sales tools you have on your side as a missionary, and, and I typically don't suggest missionaries go and use a sales tool, but the best sales tool you have to get your foot in the door as a missionary is the introduction from your neighbor. Hey, brother so-and-so told us you've had this happen in your life and maybe we could help you out a little bit. Maybe we could share a message of peace and joy because if if that member is feeling that spirit that you're sharing, the referrals are going to feel that as well. So the best gratitude you could show is by teaching his referral. Yeah, for sure. I like that. I love that. Elder Haymeyer, thank you so much for sharing. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, on, on that note, um, I'm going to kick it over to Brother Lundgren to finish us off this evening with a with a, a story and a couple of analogies that we can use to better improve as missionaries, to be more impactful. And uh, Brother Lundgren, I'll give you the floor. I appreciate that very much. Um, before I kick off, I think there's one more comment that uh, <clears throat> someone wanted to mention. So I want to make sure that we pause and listen to anything you guys are sharing because it will de definitely benefit all so go ahead and, and share what you wanted to, to share okay this is steve lundgren i'm brother lundgren's oldest brother and i just wanted to share that when i was on my mission in colorado back in 1982 and 83 back when we used to use film strip film strips and stuff one of the most important things and i'll add that Every baptism that I ever experienced on my mission came from a referral. There was one family we got very close to baptizing that we had met at a door where we went to almost all the discussions, but everyone that we ever baptized came from a referral. But we, the example that the missionaries set is crucial. There are members that don't want to share names with goofball missionaries, ones that aren't committed, ones that aren't doing what they should, they'll wait until there are missionaries that are a little more trustworthy, and then they're a little more open to share the names. And we spent a lot of time on my mission doing mem member missionary work, going to the members, sharing the ideas of how they can pray about names and post the names somewhere and try to reach certain milestones with them. But a lot of it started with setting a good example in the first place and having a good reputation going around where they thought they might be able to trust their friends with, with some missionaries. 
So I wanted to throw that in. Well, I think oh. that, uh, I'm so glad that I, I paused and, and went back because that is so important. So, um, so as an introduction, in case you can't tell what we're talking about, we're talking about how can we, how can we be better missionaries and how are we able to, to grow the opportunities of bringing souls back to our Father in Heaven. Okay, so as missionaries, the most important thing to understand is your role. And when I say missionaries, this is both full-time missionaries as well as members because all of us are missionaries. Okay, so for the full-time missionaries, don't fall into the thought that you're serving for two years, right? You will be a missionary for the rest of your life. And that is a wonderful, wonderful gift that we have to participate in helping bring souls under our Father in Heaven, okay? So the, the name of the lesson today is how to bring thousands to the covenant path in preparation for the second coming. So the first thing to understand how to do that is to make sure that you're well-grounded as a missionary. So in order to be effective, and we, again, this is week 10, so we've built many lessons to get to where we're at, but we'll, we'll kind of hit a couple of points from previous lessons, right? So number one is you must be worthy. You must be worthy. Because if you're not worthy, the spirit is not going to be able to lead you effectively. Because you won't be sensitive under the spirit the way that you should. Number two, if you're not worthy, then it impacts the ability for the spirit to be with you as you teach, okay? So number one is worthiness. Number two, remember as missionaries, it's not about you, it's always about them, right? So th the focus and your effort, your every breath, and that sounds dramatic, but it's true. Your every purpose in life on your mission is about everyone else and not about you, right? So everything you're doing, Elder Erickson, you're giving a Book of Mormon. You're going to make that Book of Mormon personal to the person that you're giving it to because it's all about them. When you start acting that way, you're, you will start noticing changes happening. You will start noticing that there is a gained trust, not just by the people that you're serving next to, but by our Father in Heaven. Right? We gain trust with our Savior and with our Father in Heaven as we are obedient and we're diligent. Kind of sounds like Doctrine and Covenants section four, doesn't it? Right? So we need to be diligent. We need to be worthy. We need to be dedicated in what we're doing. Right? And so when we're doing those things, many of the other doors start opening up and it just starts working better. So as Elder Olson shared, Brother Olson shared, the this idea that as missionaries, we're having to do it all, of our, all ourselves. Unfortunately, that happens a lot, right? And if that's what it takes, that's what it takes, right? But we need to help inspire, right, the members to work with us. And part of that is helping teach the members how to do it. So that's a bit of a, you know, a, a light bulb that pops up, it pops up in the head is the fact that most of us are challenged with how to do it, okay? So let's kind of dive into a couple of things um, to kind of teach this principle. So the first, the first, and this is kind of how we, we uh, came up with, with this lesson, right? There was that text that was received. And then there was also another scripture that was tied in with, the, with, with sort of that realization of have things changed from ancient days to now? So if we turn to Helaman, Chapter 5, verse 19. Helaman chapter 5, verse 19. Who has that? I got it. We got it. Oh, actually, hold on one sec here. I might have. Did I get that right? Helaman. Oh, sorry. I turned to 6. Let's go to Helaman 5, 19. Who has that? I, I can read it. Okay, go ahead, please. 
Therefore, they did speak unto the great astonishment of the Lamanites, to the convincing them, insomuch that there were 8,000 of the Lamanites who were in the land of Zarahemla and round about baptized under repentance, and were convinced of the wickedness of the traditions of their fathers. Okay, so let's put this into, let's put this into reality. If you were to try to give me perspective of 8,000 souls, what might that look like? Compare it to something we can get our arms around. 8,000 souls. Is that a high school? No, it's probably three high schools, at least. And those are large high schools. That's a lot of souls, okay? And if we frame who was doing this, this is Nephi and Lehi. Not the original Lehi and Nephi. This is later on Nephi, Lehi, right? Who are sons of Alma, right? Who are going forth and they are learning or they're actually executing, if you will, what we call the Lord's way of teaching, right? Hence the title, Harvesting the Lord's Way. So when we start doing it the Lord's way, whatever we thought could be done is going to be way bigger. So I got to ask everyone who's present, is it possible to have 8,000 people join the church because you're out teaching? Okay, Elder Hamer, I'm not sure your companion's name, but I I love that he's nodding and I want to know why he's nodding. Uh, His name is Elder Livingston. Sorry, Elder Livingston. Elder Livingston, I presume, right? So (laughs) uh, go ahead. And share with me why you were nodding your head that that wouldn't be crazy. Um, well, what my thought process is, is that they, they were both missionaries, like how we're both missionaries. And as, as we said here, you know, we gain trust in the Lord as we are diligent and worthy. And if we're doing all that we can and we're, we're you know, taking care of our referrals and we're being obedient and we're, we're, we're using using members um, or having members help us, then then the Lord will provide a way for us to 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 invite you know everyone who who need to be gathered. So I think it I think it's completely possible. Can I say something too? Please. You uh, made me think of uh, something in Doctrine and Covenants where it talks about God is not a respecter of persons, which means. He doesn't think any higher of Joseph Smith or Lehi or Nephi than he does about you or me, which means if we have the same desires they had and the same work ethic and diligence, we can do the same exact things. He's just waiting for us to finally reach out and become like that. Exactly. So Isaiah talks about in Isaiah 11, 9, he talks about how the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, which means that the gospel must be carried to all parts of the earth, okay? For that to happen, can we continue doing it the way we're doing it now? And the answer is not a chance because we're not doing it with the power of the Lord behind us in the ways that he could do it. It can be amplified greatly. Okay. So it also says in doctrine and covenants, 8873, it talks about how the Lord says he will hasten the work in its time. So back when we had our lesson about doctrine and covenants four, and we started it with a marvelous work and a wonder. is about to come forth. And we talked about, have we really seen what the Lord was referring to? Who thinks we've seen the marvelous work and a wonder that the Lord was referring to that would be present on the earth? And I don't- Brother Lundgren. Yes. Real quick, I, I want those who are currently on their missions right now and, and those who are not yet and those who are member missionaries to hear this. Think about real quick the, the happenings of this year. When we think about it, with the first thing we think about is the pandemic, right? It's insanity. 
Um, we think about all that going on, but what did the pandemic do for missionary work in the United States of America? It literally brought home from other countries thousands of missionaries who were placed in missions all across the United States. I'm in South Florida. We had placed here from other countries where they were serving prior to the pandemic, upwards of 150 missionaries. Do you think the people in South Florida need missionaries? Think about your missions that you're serving in. Elder Haymeyer Olson and his companion, I believe, are on the call. How many missionaries were placed in your mission from somewhere else where they were serving prior to the pandemic? Think about where you're called to go, Ryan and Elder Erickson. You're called to go to different countries. But before you go there, the Lord wants you to knock out some missionary work here in the United States of America. Why? Because he's hastening his work. There is about to be, and you're about to see it with your own eyes, a marvel and a wonder like you have never seen before. So let me share a story. Um, last night, I was invited over to a lady's home to have dinner with both she and her daughter. And the reason we were invited over was that they wanted to um, have a gospel discussion, okay? And so we'd had an initial gospel discussion with her and the things that we talked about have continued to uh, kind of consume her thoughts. And so she actually reached out to me with an invitation to come over because she wanted to discuss more, okay? So we had a, again, a great discussion yesterday, but here's what I want you to, here's what I want you to understand what happened. So we went over to teach both she and her daughter more truths, if you will, more principles of the gospel. But at the end, as we were kind of um, getting close to leaving, she said, she said, Dave, she said, you have a really good understanding of the Bible. And she says, I have a really good friend of mine who's Jewish. And eight months ago, if I said the name Jesus Christ, she got angry at me literally got angry, did not want to hear it, wanted nothing to do with it. She's Jewish, right? So it wasn't her thing. So she's been working with her and sharing things about Jesus and sharing, you know, what I'll call podcasts or, or um, uh, you know, things she can listen to. And over time, she's had sort of this uh, softening occur where now she's she's getting she's she's no longer angry when when Jesus Christ the name is brought up and in matter of fact she's starting to study and be interested in Christianity and so I had my investigator invite me to come back to teach other people a Jewish lady, what I'm teaching and what I'm sharing. So put that in your head about how you can have your investigators now be growing your teaching ability, right? So let's take this back to how Brother Olson shared at the beginning, someone who was baptized roughly a year ago and has been giving uh, referrals in the Haiti area. Elder Olson, how many referrals roughly have been submitted by this person. Oh man, I can't even put it. I have thousands. 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 
roughly, I don't know, 3,000 ish. Yeah. One guy. Yes, Elder Livingston, one guy. And they're being taught. They're being taught. Believe it or not, the church is having to reroute more missionaries to that area because of this. Okay? That can happen in other places as well, right? So I want you to see one person can make a difference. Now, think about this. I want you to share another story, Brother Olson. You, there was someone else who was baptized last year. And when she was baptized, she shared with you something about, I'll give you a hint so you can share the story, genealogy. Can you share the story of, of a truth that finally made sense to her in her family and why she never understood why she was doing it, but now what's happening? This is how you go from one to thousands. Please start sharing. Are we talking, or we're talking about Jean's wife? You are, you are correct. Okay, so, so um, his wife, it's interesting that the first time, and I may be sharing the wrong story, but there- no, I think the, you're good. The first time she went to the temple with all the kids to do baptisms for the dead, um, it was my pleasure to be an ordinance worker there in the temple that evening. And I kept getting this feeling that I needed to go to the baptismal area of the temple. So I finally wandered over there and, and um, I saw this family. They're all Haitian, Haitian American. I mean, when, when it comes to skin color, I don't know, you know, if all of you know, but Haitian is as black as they come. And there they are in this white clothing. And I was asked to change into a jumpsuit and go baptize this woman in the font. <clears throat> Her son wasn't yet a priest, so he couldn't do it. So I remember walking down into the font, and the kids had all been baptized, but they wanted to sit there. There's four children. They wanted to sit and watch mom be baptized for the dead. And as I pulled her out of the water after the first time, and then the second time, I kept hearing noises from over in the direction of where the kids were sitting. And she told me that she was hearing her grandmother ecstatically laughing for joy. She was joyous. I said, your grandmother, is your grandmother still alive? She said, no, she's dead. And I said, now you understand. She said, yes, I do. They've been working ecstatically on their family history and every week up until the temple was shut down for the pandemic back in March, they were at the temple religiously every single night that the temple was open, being baptized for their ancestors. Think about the impact of missionary work, right? We go back to Helaman 15. And the more part of them were adding many to their numbers daily. Think about the people you bring. They are all attached to exponentially many people that they will bring to the gospel because you decided to speak with them. You decided to open your mouth. You decided to say, hey, I'm here to serve you. What do you need? I want you to add one more component to the story, if you don't mind, Elder Ol or Brother Olson. Um, when she heard the gospel and you talked about temples and you talked about the importance of, of family, she shared with you something they had been doing as a family for many, many, many generations. Oh, yeah. They, that means. they showed us the, the books and 
books and books of their family history. I think when we were teaching them, we didn't even get to see all of these books that they documented from, I mean, as far as I know, it went all the way back to Adam, I'm sure, based on the number of books. But but she had these old tattered books. And when we helped them move, I saw the true meaning of it. We actually emptied their apartment of all these books and every closet in the apartment of crates full of books, but their storage unit as well. Book after book of documented family history because that's how important family is to the Haitian people. Notes on everyone, but when she was in the font that day and I brought her up, she finally understood why grandma and grandpa had told them to keep and manage their family journals and history. How powerful is that? You're right, Dave. I missed that. Totally missed it. But that's, that's significant. Yeah, that, and that was a story I thought you'd be sharing because just that one person and that family was baptized. The brother has shared roughly 3,000 some mm-hmm. odd referrals. Now, let me tell you, let me add to the story because okay. the brother, the family was baptized last November. The husband couldn't be baptized because of some things in his life. And, you know, we all make mistakes and whatnot. And he was so tragically disappointed. I said to him, I said, brother, don't be disappointed. Between now and the time you can get baptized, act as if you're baptized. And he literally has acted like a member. He was given a calling and he has been dishing out referrals by the boatload. The guy drives for Uber and gives out so many referrals not only to Haiti, but to people visiting from almost every country in the world to tour here in South Florida. He picks them up at the airport and and he tells them about a living prophet named Russell M. Nelson. And he tells them about the Book of Mormon and how it has changed his life and his family's life. I mean, he spends the majority of his time bearing testimony. So for, um, he was, they were baptized, I think, end of October. And he was bat. Maybe it was in September, but he was he was baptized in February of this last year, or December, December twenty eighth. He was baptized. They were baptized in February. He was baptized in December of last year, and that entire time, he shared the gospel with more people than any true baptized and confirmed member I've ever met in my life. And I always say this uh, about this dear brother. He's an amazing man. He's got some challenges like everybody else, but there is no member missionary on earth like him. And, and because of his valiance in sharing the gospel, people in Haiti are joining the church left and right. And it's amazing to see. And their family history, I mean, they have a lot of work to do. They have more work to do in the temple than probably most people I would think of. We just have to work harder for the names we have. They don't. They can look them up right in their book and, and go off the records. But um, they're a great example of what happens when a missionary says, hey, I'm here to serve you. What can I do to benefit your life? Brother Longry. Thank you very much. So there's a, uh, in the essence of time, I'm going to share one more concept. And it goes back to uh, Elder Erickson, this idea of giving out a Book of Mormon. And I'm going to give you a little bit different perspective of what you're doing. Okay. So this last week, Ryan had to uh, go to get his suit altered. And the lady that we went to has i uh, been involved in doing a lot of alterations of various different mi- missionaries over time. And, you know, because she's dealt with a lot of members of the church, she's had people try to, you know, tell her about the gospel. She has Book of Mormons that are sitting on the shelf, multiples, right? But the, 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 what's happened is that people 
are looking so hard to share the gospel, but not in necessarily a way that she understands the value or that it connects with her. And the result is she really hasn't done anything with it, right? So she has, you know, it's, it feels good to give a Book of Mormon. So now here's the, the next piece, uh, Elder Erickson, is, is now what we want to do is take the giving of the Book of Mormon and we're going to take it from the idea of giving a book to making the book personal. Okay. So the way you make the book personal is you share as an example, I think Elder Campbell, you know, talked about a testimony and how you can, you know, connect it to the person in a, in a personal way. But, but for her, right. Um, if she is, Christian, you can ask questions, right? And find out, um, oh, you know, that's great. You've heard these. I'm just curious, right? You know, are you, are you Christian? And then, you know, then she can give a response, a yes or a no, whatever happens to be in her case. It's a yes, right? And say, that's wonderful. That is so great because it, you know, that's exactly, that's exactly what I am, right? That's why I'm going out, out to serve. And one of the things I'm so excited to share is, is uh, what's in the book over there on the shelf that you received. I don't know if you know, but if you pull it out, let's go ahead and grab that. And you can pull it out. And it talks about another testament of Jesus Christ, right? So you can ask the question, what is it you're doing to draw closer unto your Savior, Jesus Christ, right? And let them answer. Let them talk. It's about them. It's not about you, right? And once you start getting that dialogue, now you're going to see kind of how to share. But here's the principle I want to leave, right? I want to leave with the idea that when we are, think of the woman at the well, right? When Christ was talking to the woman at the well and, and he, he asked for water, right? And so she's thinking very literally about a well and water and so forth. And that's how he started. Can you, he asked something from her. He asked her to serve him right? So as a missionary, you can ask someone to serve you too, right? So Christ asked her to serve him. But he then, as always, he personalized something for her that became very impactful. And it was the concept of living water. And when he shared what living water was, she said what? Master, how can I have that of which you speak? I want some of that. I want that living water that I will not thirst anymore, right? So think about when you're giving a Book of Mormon, share it in a sense of living water. How can you make that an impactful gift or exchange where you're giving the book? And you share about how much you love Jesus Christ, right? And what he's done for you that has really made you so much happier, right? And such a better person. And, and, and then share how you love how it talks about when Jesus Christ came to the Americas after he resurrected in Jerusalem. And has she ever read that account when Jesus Christ came here to teach the people here? And of course, the answer is going to be no. She's never heard of that, right? And so turn the book, open it up, show her, mark it, make it live. Say, do you like to read? She'll say, yes, start here. Start here, but make sure you pray before you read. See, I'm talking a very, look her in the eyes. I'm talking in a very personal sense, right? After this type of an exchange, what happens even if that Book of Mormon goes back to the shelf? It will never be the same. That Book of Mormon now has life. It has become living water. So it could be a day, it could be a month, it could be a year, it could be 10 years, it could be 20 years. It doesn't matter. 
because it will still be alive. Every time she looks at it, she'll feel that same spirit. She'll remember that conversation. And guess what's going to happen? She's going to pick it up and she's going to read because the spirit won't let her rest until that happens. That, Elder Erickson, is giving a Book of Mormon. Does that make sense? So appreciate everyone's time today. We've hit the hour mark. Uh, this is always such a great experience to be able to, uh, to share and, and explore as we all kind of scuba dive together, deep dive into how to do it the Lord's way, right? And I promise you, I promise you that as you love and as you go out and you work, whether it's an, a friend, whether it's uh, a ward member, and you sit down with them and you make it personal and you talk about this sharing of living water and how, how you can bless someone else's life, you will see miracles happen. you'll teach more than you ever thought you could teach. And it will continue to ripple because every time you teach, you will ask them to invite another person or family who would also benefit from this. And it will continue to grow. And every time it grows, it'll grow again. And then it will grow again. And at a very short period of time, the church, when we have 16, 17 million people, it won't be crazy to be at 100 million, and then 400 million, and then we're at a billion. That is the Lord's way. That is the Lord's way. And we're now in the best spot at the absolute best time to be part of this marvelous work and a wonder. And I share this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Lundgren. Um, Brother Lundgren's right. You have all been reserved for this time. The idea isn't just to give out a bunch of Book of Mormons with no impact. Right? I'm sure there's this, this alteration lady has... 10 Book of Mormons on her bookshelf, right? Or she takes them to the Goodwill or the Salvation Army thrift store and hopes that someone who might like it will pick it up for someone for Christmas. At the end of the day, you're a missionary. You want to have a conversation of spiritual consequence. You do not just want to hand somebody a Book of Mormon. Right on my mission in the inner city of Philadelphia, we got mugged all the time. And I learned really fast not to carry my wallet, right? I, carry, I carried my SEPTA transit pass in my sock, and I carried a backpack full of Book of Mormons. Because I knew if the muggers took anything, they would take the bag of Books of Mormon, and they would, they would either drop them on the ground or maybe their hearts would change. I always found that bag that got taken a few blocks away down an alley by a dumpster. Always. In fact, after my first six months in the mission, I could have told you on the next day where that backpack would end up. Because they would open it and see a bunch of Vietnamese books of Mormon and go, oh, this isn't valuable. Little did they know the value those books have. I encourage you to give a Book of Mormon as a commitment after you've had a conversation of spiritual consequence. Ask them about their life. Ask them about their challenges. Ask them how you can serve them and then provide them a resource that will change their lives for good. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Your challenge for next week, invite one person, bring them, join the, the meeting. Let's grow this and let's build our efforts and baptize cities. And I promise you will be blessed.